We recently spent some time talking about Christian apologetics. Apologetics is an argument for the justification of something. In our case, what we believe. We looked at why we should believe in God. We looked at why we should believe the Bible to be the Word of God and to be true. I did a couple of messages showing you how science doesn't, real science doesn't contradict the Bible. It actually confirms it. And we spent a couple of weeks talking about God's attributes, what God is like, who He is. And to understand who He is, you begin to realize who He isn't. That'll be real pertinent in today's message. Today's message is really the most important apologetic of all. The Bible, among other things, describes God as good, loving, and powerful. As people observed all the tragedy that happens in a real world around us, they have a hard time believing that that kind of God could exist. They think this, if there is a God, he must be dreadful. If he's loving and good and all-powerful, then why doesn't he stop all of the injustice, the wars, the shootings, etc.? If God is so good, then why is life here so bad? These are the questions that keep people from faith, and they're the questions that shatter people who have think they have faith. So I want to speak to you on a good God in an unkind world. First of all, in your outline, number one, God often gets blamed for what he doesn't do. He often gets blamed for what he doesn't do. Under that, first, nature is unlike God intended it to be. It's unlike God intended it to be. Newsrooms and insurance companies call, often refer to natural disasters, earthquakes, tornadoes, floods, etc., as acts of God. They're not acts of God, they're results of sin. Nature is broken under a curse. Romans 8 says that nature groans awaiting its redemption. It's not as God intended, and the reason is man's sin. As is usually the case, sin costs us far more than we imagined that it would. Romans 8, 21 to 22 talks about nature groaning, awaiting its redemption. Revelation 22, 3 says that one day there will no longer be any curse. The implication, of course, is that now there is. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says that Satan is the God, little g, of this world. 1 John 5.19 says that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. In Luke 4.6, Satan told Jesus when he was tempting him, the kingdoms of the world have all been handed over to me, and I can give them to whoever I please. Jesus did not dispute what he said. Nature is not as God intended it to be. It'd be more accurate to say that natural disasters are acts of sin and or of Satan. Number two, under that, people are unlike God intended them to be. People are unlike God intended them to be. As with angels, God gave man choice. Man chose to sin. Genesis 1, 26 and 7 tells us that man was created in God's image according to his likeness. After sin in Genesis 5, 3, we learn that Adam bears children in his image, not God's, his image, and according to his likeness. Romans 3, 23 says that all men are now sinners. Romans 7, 14 to 24 says that even people who are trying to do the right thing often do the wrong thing. The good news is that we're free to choose our behavior. The bad news is so is everybody else. Good, bad, and evil. Nature is unlike God intended. People are unlike God intended. Number three, life is unlike God intended for it to be. Ecclesiastes 4.4 tells us that everything people do is a result of competition. We compete with each other rather than love each other. We are against rather than for. As with Jesus' disciples, we have to establish which one of us is the greatest. All those things are a result of sin. Both Ecclesiastes 7.15 and 8.14, I'm not reading either of those in the message, but you need to read those day. Great, great verses. Tell us that in this life, good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people. In other words, the Bible makes it really clear that life is not fair. 
It's not fair. Solomon was as disillusioned about it as we are. Life is unlike God meant for it to be. Now, Revelation 21, 4 reminds us that one day God will have us back in his kind of world where there's no sickness, sorrow, suffering, pain, death, tears, an exponentially upgraded paradise. So God is not the source of evil, pain, suffering, and death. He often, though, gets blamed for what he does not do. Now, number two, God often gets credit for what he doesn't do. He often gets credit for what he doesn't do. He gets blamed for catastrophic events that he does not create. And sometimes he gets credit for desirable circumstances that he probably did not orchestrate. People think that God did it when God might not have done it at all. Ecclesiastes 7, 15 and 8, 14 say that good and bad happen to everyone. So good things happen to bad people. Is that what God does? Does he bless bad people? Things going well for you is not proof that you're a good person. Things going poorly for you is not proof that you're a bad person. It's just things that are happening in your world. Both happen to good people and both happen to bad people in a cursed, not like it's supposed to be world. A world like God never intended. In Psalm 73, the psalmist cannot understand why bad people seem to prosper. They have it good. They have easy lives. And he contemplates, is it worth serving God if this is true? But then it says he comes into God's sanctuary, literally into his presence, and there he perceives their end. He now recognizes how the stories will end, and he continues to follow the Lord. The righteous will ultimately win. The wicked will ultimately lose. Now look at what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 9.11. Again, I saw under the sun, that's Solomon's words for the, in the cursed world. I saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, the battle's not to the warriors, neither is bread to the wise, nor wealth to the discerning, nor favor to the men to men of ability, for time and chance overtake them all. The fastest guy doesn't always win the race. The strongest military doesn't always win the army. The wise man doesn't always end up with money. Time and chance overtake them all. Think about it. Two people are praying. One's praying for rain. The other's praying for it not to rain. Whose prayer is God supposed to answer? If it rains, did God answer that man's prayer? And if it rains, did God not answer the other man's prayer? Did he answer the first man's prayer because he is a better man than the second man? What if one man was praying for rain and a hundred were praying for it not to rain? Whose prayer is he going to answer? But it rained. Did God not care about the many who prayed for it not to rain? Or did time and chance overtake them all? Two Christians are wanting. They're maybe even praying for a good parking space at the restaurant. Does God favor the one who gets it? Was God with him? Does God not favor the one who gets there second and doesn't get the spot? Was he not good to the one who doesn't get the parking place? Or do time and chance overtake them all? We're grateful for how God spared, uh, how Wayfloy was spared in the Gatlinburg fire several years ago. Now, was our good fortune orchestrated by God? Or were we just spared by time and chance? If you say that God protected Wayfloy, then you have to say God did not protect all those other people and businesses who were burned out. You got it? If God protected us, he sure didn't protect them. Well, God blessed us. Well, he screwed them, right? If that's, what you, that's going to be your language. Did God love us or Wayfloor more than the host of Christians who lost everything in that fire? Or like the rain falls on the just and the unjust, did time and chance, in this case a fire, overtake some, take some out and leave some standing? When the, we went to the Mossy Grove tornadoes, which I'll mention a little bit later, the tornadoes come through there. One house is completely gone and it bounces over the next house is still intact. Did God protect the people who lived in the house that didn't go down? He might have been a drug dealer. Did he not protect the people in the house that's gone? They might have been good Christians. Time and chance overtake them all.
Now understand this, God can and he sometimes does orchestrate circumstances. He sent Joseph to Egypt by the hand of his jealous brothers. He slipped Esther into a harem uh, of a, to be chosen as queen of an unbelieving nation. But just because God can and just because God has does not mean that God does or that he will. He dictated a flood in Noah's day. But as far as we know, that's the only time he's done that. God dictated a drought in Elijah's day. There have been lots of droughts since, but did God create those droughts? We don't know. God split the Red Sea and the Jordan River for the children of Israel to go through on dry ground. Now, when you come to a bridge, I'm guessing when you come to a river, I'm guessing either you got to have a boat, a bridge, or you're going for a swim, right? You're not getting dry ground. Can God split the river? Yes. But just because he can, just because he has, does not mean that he will and does not mean that he does. He healed only one. You know, people think that everybody in the Bible got healed. Jesus healed everybody. When he went to the pool of Bethesda, he healed one man. Went to one man and said, do you wish to be well? And he left conceivably hundreds of people there that he could have healed, but he did not. Don't miss the end of that verse. Time and chance overtake them all. Some things just happen. God doesn't orchestrate them. Satan doesn't orchestrate them. They just happen. It happens if you're good. It happens if you're bad. Ecclesiastes 7, 15 and 8, 14. Again, Solomon acknowledges how unfair life is under the sun. Sometimes the bad person prospers and sometimes the good person suffers. It's like money. You always think, you know, God seems to, the people that end up with the money seem to be the wrong people. Won't you have some godly Christians really get loaded who are generous? Well, they're not the people who usually end up loaded, right? It's usually bad guys who are stealing elections. I, I didn't say that. Forgive me, Lord. Uh, at least they're trying to. I did say that. Time and chance overtake them all. Now, let me tell you how I navigate this. I'm grateful to God for all the good that I experienced. James 1.17 says, every good and perfect gift comes down from above. So I'm grateful to God for all the good that's in my life. Now, having said that, I recognize that just as there are a lot of bad things that happened to us that God didn't have anything to do, it's likely there are good things happened that he didn't orchestrate either. Sometimes time and chance is your friend. Sometimes time and chance is your enemy. Now I want to be real honest with you. Most people who go to church and call themselves Christians want to live in a black and white world where everything is either right or wrong and we always have the answer. But the truth is life is full of gray areas. I guess that people in general, but definitely church people, don't want to have to mentally and emotionally wrestle with what they don't know, what they can't understand, and what they sure can't explain. If you'll be honest with God about, uh, with God, about God, uh, the Bible, and life, then you will not have all the answers. You just don't. In fact, the closer, the more you know God, the more you'll know you don't know God. The more you understand, the more you'll understand you don't understand. You seem to grow more ignorant with your knowledge. That's just how life is. God macro manages creation. That's overseeing the big picture. If you go to UT and take economics, you'll study macroeconomics. It's the big picture economics. He macro manages creation, but he, he can, but he seldom seems to micro manage creation or our lives. So, for example, after church, you're going to do what you decide to do. God is not going to orchestrate that. This, this evening, you're going to do what you decide to do. God's not going to orchestrate that. He doesn't micro manage our lives, He gives us that responsibility. Now, people who don't understand this blame God for what he doesn't do, and sometimes they give him credit for what he might not have done. So in your outline, 
What do we know about prayer? I've did two messages in pretty recent past about the truth about prayer. If you liked a, a whole lot of detail, all the conditions of prayer, only one is unconditional. But anyway, what do we know about prayer? Does God answer our prayers the way we wish him to? Is he supposed to? Is that his job? Is it his job to answer my prayers and make me happy, to give me what I want? Is prayer a magic lamp that I rub and the genie gives me three wishes? Under that, number one, the purpose of prayer is not for us to get what we want, but for God to get what he wants. It's not for us to get what we want, it's for God to get what he wants. God didn't design prayer for us to get what we want out of him. He designed prayer to get what he wants out of us. He's not a Santa Claus waiting for us to give him our list. God is a Lord waiting for us to give him our lives. People who seek to use God see him as someone who's supposed to give them what they want. People who love God see themselves as people who are supposed to give to him what he wants. Big difference. Number two, the primary condition of answered prayer is praying according to his will. It's praying according to his will. Real prayer doesn't start with our wants, it starts with his will. What we do is we just pray, we go, dear Lord, and then we start blabbing off everything we want. The real purpose of prayer is to get before God in Ecclesiastes 5, 1, 2, maybe 3. It talks about when you get in the presence of God, be still and listen rather than offering the sacrifice of fools. You need to spend more time listening. Why? Because the most important thing that happens in prayer is not going to be what you tell God. You're not going to tell him anything he doesn't know. But it's what he might prompt you to understand. What you might quote here. So real prayer doesn't start with our wants, it starts with his will. There are a lot of conditions to answered prayer. None of them stand alone except the last one. So for example, pray believing. Does that mean if I believe I'll be a billionaire, I'll become one? Well, no, it doesn't. That's one condition of, of many. There are actually nine, I believe. But the last one stands alone. It's in 1 John 5, 14 to 15. And there we're told that we get what we ask for when we pray according to God's will. The essence of prayer, listen, is discerning what God wants to do, asking him to do it so that he does it so that you know that he's real. I'll say that again. The essence of prayer is you discerning God's will so you can ask him to do it so that when he does it, you know that he's real. You have relationship, eternal life, John 17, 3. Prayer is not magic. It's not how we strong arm God to get the things out of him that we want him to do for us or give to us. In James 5, 16, it talks about the effective prayer of a righteous man accomplishing much. Now, why does the, the prayer of a righteous man accomplish much? Because a righteous man will pray according to God's will. He will not pray according to whatever it is he wished he had or wanted. Prayer doesn't get us everything we want. It doesn't enable us to avoid everything we don't want. The purpose of prayer is about God's will, not our wants. His will being done in earth, in our lives, as it is in heaven. So God is loving, or if God is loving, if God is good, and if he's God, therefore powerful, how do you explain the awful things that happen to people in this world? This is the big burning question in the unchurched person's mind and in the minds of people who go to church who've experienced horrific suffering. This is especially true in our day of school and mass shootings, senseless random and violence. So you have a, a, a man in Philadelphia just walking down the road and a bunch of punks come up and beat him to death. Had another, happened in another place, a guy just died. I can't remember where that was located. Uh, some of you are NASCAR fans. Some NASCAR race car driver was at a, a gas station getting gas and some guy that got into some kind of confrontation, the guy pulled out a knife, stabbed him and killed him. That's the world we live in. Where's God? How could you tell me he's good if he's powerful? How could you tell me he loves me if he's strong? Where's God when a woman's raped or a child's abused? Where's God when acts of nature devastate people's lives? Where's God when people are mistreated? Where's God when life is brutal, and it often is? 
Where's God when you're praying for healing and your disease gets worse? Where's God when you need a miracle and you don't get one? Where's God when his people are slaves in Egypt for 400 years? Where's God when Christians in Africa are getting slaughtered? Where's God when the co-pastor wife of Bethel Church in California that has a school of supernatural ministry that teaches God some miraculous healing dies of breast cancer? Where's God? Local and true. Where's God when a super healthy pastor of 40 years retires and is almost immediately diagnosed with pancreatic cancer? Where's God when his wonderful wife contracts the same horrible disease? Where's God when the plans for a long, enjoyable retirement are over for both of them in a short, terrible three years? John and Phyllis Stone, Brian Bible Church and School. Where's God when a lifelong pastor retires in, in, uh, intending to enjoy a long retirement with his super healthy wife? But in a period of months, she has cancer and she's gone. About a year later, that same pastor loses, loses an adult child, adult daughter, to cancer. Ron and Becky Stewart, Grace Baptist Church and Schools. A lot of you know the name Adrian Rogers, Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis. In my opinion, he was one of, if not the greatest church leader of the past hundred years. Where's God when his baby dies in its crib on Mother's Day? Having lived a healthy life, expected a long and fruitful retirement, cancer took Adrian to heaven soon after he stepped down from church. Where's God? Back to your outline. What do we know about suffering? <clears throat> what do we know about suffering? Number one, God is the chief sufferer in life. God is the chief sufferer in life. Is God orchestrating these people's pain or is he the chief sufferer in every story? The more you love, the more you hurt. We'll talk about grief next Sunday. When you lose somebody, the more you love them, the more it hurts, right? If somebody dies you don't really love, it's not a big deal. The more you love them, the more it hurts. The one who loves most hurts most. And since God loves best, he hurts most. Romans 8, 26 says that the Spirit intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Romans 8 says creation groans. Why? It's messed up. We groan. Why? Because we're messed up. God groans. Why? Because it's all messed up. God grieves and groans when we suffer. When life is unfair and brutal, it's not because God isn't loving and good and strong. It's a result of sin. Man's sin put a curse on this world. Man's sin put a curse on mankind. Man's sin handed this world over to the evil one who can give it to whoever he pleases. Man's sin resulted in life being horrifically unfair at times. Man has reaped what he has sowed in his sin. Galatians 1.4 says that Jesus died to deliver us from this present evil age. Now most of us are going to be delivered from this present evil age by result of the evil, which is death. Some of us maybe will be snatched away at the rapture. So where was God when the Mossy Grove tornadoes devastated families in Morgan County in 2002? But one place God was, was in the heart of a people called Corrington Church. They threw a huge party for devastated families, giving them tens of thousands of dollars of stuff to help them get back on their feet. Where was God when the Gatlinburg fire destroyed hundreds of homes and businesses in 2016? One place, God was in the heart of a people called Corrington Church, who gave thousands of dollars of relief and, as I recall, 15 good used cars to families who lost cars and had no insurance. We also blessed a bunch of firemen, which brings us to number two. God's the chief sufferer in life. Number two, God cares for those who hurt through his people. God cares for those who hurt through his people. A lot of people live their lives in what we might call the margins. They're kind of unseen, unheard, under-resourced, overlooked. Does God know and does he care? 
Our church has spent years helping local organizations help those people. Every year we buy over $18,000 of groceries for disadvantaged families. Where is God? He's in the people of Christian organizations that do these ministries, and he's in the heart of churches like ours. Most of you know that when, since the Mossy Grove tornadoes, our church has hosted an annual Christmas party for under-resourced, marginalized families. We've probably given away a million dollars worth of clothes, food, tools, bikes, toys, small appliances, and more. Does God know about these often forgotten people? Does he care? Yes, he does. He lives in the heart of a people called Corton Church who make their Christmases about giving those people a good Christmas. Seemingly forgotten, Africans live in the landfill in Victoria Falls, Zimbabwe. They live out of the garbage, competing with animals for the food in the garbage brought there from the hotels. But God knows they're there and he cares. He providentially arranged for a church, our church, to do a missionary retreat there. A driver takes us to see animals. And he says, if you don't mind the garbage, there'll be all kinds of monkeys, literally big baboons, at the, at the dump site. We said, well, let's go. So off we go. The driver took us there to see animals. God took us there to see these people who lived there and ate out of the garbage. We literally saw them stand under a garbage truck. It was, the garbage was dumping on them, trying to get the first dibs on the food. Does God care? He does. He providentially arranged for us to be, arranged for us to be there that day. And since then, we purchased land, built a house, paid for a well, and much more through a family who serves God in us there. We send the money every few weeks to buy groceries to take it to them. Mika's raising pigs. He just slaughtered another pig and took the, took the pork there to the people at the, at the dump site. There's a young boy who lived there at the dump the first day we saw him. Of course, his, his clothes are just filthy. They're tattered. He's in two different tennis shoes. Neither match. They both look like... You, you wouldn't have done anything but put them in your garbage. They were just nasty, awful. His sole possession was a deflated soccer ball. So one of the first things we did, we said, get that boy a ball. And we got him a ball. His name is Becky, B-H-E-K-I, maybe Briss pronouncing it. And Brecky now is in school. He would never have attended school. He'd have grown up, lived and died in that garbage dump unless the country ran him out of it. Does God care? You better believe he cares. He cares to his people, people like us. If God is loving, good, and strong, when children, uh, when children bury their parents too early or parents bury their child or when a mate buries their love of his life or her life, is he still good and loving, strong? He is. God grieves for us. He grieves with us. He who loves best hurts most. He's with us even when it feels like he isn't. He gives us strength when we're usually unaware that we have it until someday we look back and realize we made it. He provides through churches with people who can be God with skin on and help us in our pain and our loss. Number three, God doesn't allow more on us than we can handle if we trust him. If we trust him. 1 Corinthians 10 and 11 promises that God will not allow more on us than we can handle if, if, if we walk with him and trust him. But most people who are handling it don't feel like they're handling it. Most of them feel like they're drowning. You discover that you handled it sometime later when you look back and you realize that you made it. In the midst of it, you just thought you were drowning. Number four. God gives us grace, strength that we need. He gives us grace or strength that we need. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 promises God will give us grace, strength that is sufficient if we'll walk with him and trust him. But most people who experience sufficient grace don't feel like they're experiencing sufficient grace. They just feel like they're holding on for dear life, barely surviving. You discover that you had sufficient grace sometime later on when you look back and you realize you made it. I didn't think I could survive this. I survived it. I didn't think I could go on. I've gone on. I didn't think I could get out of bed. I got out of bed. 
Victory isn't always shouting hallelujah and praising the Lord. Sometimes it's just holding on for dear life. And if you're his, when you, no, when you can no longer hold on to him, he'll hold on to you. Embrace your pain. Surrender to him. He'll carry you. You might not feel like you're being carried. It'll probably feel more like complete aloneness. But God is there with you whether you feel him or not. I believe that he's especially near when you feel like he's a million miles away. Number five, we walk by faith. We walk by faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. If you've got it all figured out, you don't need faith. If the odds are in your favor, you don't need faith. If you can feel God's presence, you don't need any faith. When you're pretty sure it'll work out, you don't need faith. When you need faith is when you don't know how it's going to work out and you don't feel God and you don't understand why this happened and you can't believe it's happening to you. Now you need some faith. Faith is believing what God has said in his word when I'm full of doubt. It's believing God's word over all the thoughts that are running rampant in my head and all the emotions that are pulling me down. It seems to me that a lot of people in church today have what I call a bumper sticker or t-shirt faith. Also it could be a social media post faith. They have some slogan that they proudly display that often is not good theology and that will not work for them someday when life unfairly shatters their world. And all of our worlds eventually get shattered. One of those is God's got this or God's got you. Sounds great on a bumper sticker or a t-shirt, but here's the problem. God had John the Baptist. He got beheaded. God had Jesus. He got tortured and crucified. God had the apostles. They all died for their faith. God having it or you does not insulate you from time and chance in a cursed world. And if you believe it does, one day your world's going to get shattered and your faith is going to be destroyed because you believe the lie that if I'll be good, if I'll follow Jesus, nothing bad can happen to me. You cannot get that theology from the Bible. You can only get that from, uh, from, from deceitful, optimistic preachers who want to be positive and keep you coming. Say, Rocky, you need to be more positive. I'm positive about what I'm telling you, okay? That's positive. <laughs> I'm real positive. Life's going to happen to you someday. It's going to come out of nowhere and it's going to knock all that wind out of you. It's going to be harder than you ever imagined it could be. And you're going to find out what you got with Jesus. You're going to find out if you really know him. You're going to find out if you really love him. You're going to find out if you really trust him. And if you will, you're going to become a way better person and Christian on the other side of it. And if you don't, you're in trouble. You'll become cynical. You'll blame God for not doing what he never said he would do. When you experience the worst of life in a cursed world, you better have more than a slogan on your shirt or your car. You'd better know the Bible. You'd better know who God is and who God isn't. What he's promised to do, what he's never promised he would do. You'd better know and believe what Solomon observed and recorded in Ecclesiastes. You'd better know that you're not insulated from pain or tragedy in a cursed world. You'd better know where God is when you don't know where God is. You'd better know that you can handle what you can't, don't think you can handle. You'd better know that God is giving you the strength you need when you don't feel like you have the strength you need. If you walk by sight when life knocks the wind out of you, you're going to walk away from God. If you don't understand what I'm saying today, one day, because of your wrong beliefs about God, your faith is going to be shattered. Now, here's something completely amazing about God. If there's no other reason to follow the Lord, this is a great one right here. Number six, God uses bad for good. God is so amazing, so strong, so good, so loving, he uses bad for good. Romans 8, 28, 29 says that God uses life, everything good and bad, to conform us to the image of his son. Underneath all the brokenness of what you think you want, because you were made by God to live in his image, what you want most is to be like him. 
You don't feel that way. You don't think that way because you're, you're under such a pile of brokenness because of sin. But that's what you really want more than anything else. God takes the bad, by the way, God uses the bad more than he uses the good to change us. Blessings can entitle you. Uh, trial and difficulties, they'll break you. They'll make you into something you weren't before, good or bad, depending on whether you trust the Lord. Now, this doesn't make, God doesn't make bad things good. If you bury the love of your life, that's never going to be good. It's bad. But what he does do is he, he takes that bad and does something good with it. Part of that good is breaking us of our pride and self-confidence. Part of that good is teaching us how to love and trust God when we don't understand and when we hate what's going on in our lives. Part of that good is realizing you're not in control. I mean, you control one person yourself and most of you don't do a good job at that. You sure don't control the world and you sure don't control other people and you sure don't control disease. You'll find yourself to be pretty powerless, which makes an all-powerful God pretty attractive, doesn't it? Part of the good is coming to know God in a deeper, new and deeper level than you would ever have known him without the pain and loss. Prior to Job's catastrophic losses, he knew God, his words were, by the hearing of the ear. But after he lost all of his children, all of his fortune, his health almost died, refusing to let go or give up, he says in the middle of that book, though he slay me, I will hope in him. Refusing to give up, at the end, Job says, now my eyes see you. He knows him in a way he had never known him. My life took an enormous leap about seven years ago. I went through hell on earth for two or three years. But I drew near to God rather than blamed him for the things I was having to deal with. And he made me into something I would never have become without all that pain. On the other side of what you will one day have to go through is the person you want to be. It's who God wants you to become. Deuteronomy 23, 5 tells us that God turns curses into blessing because he loves us. God is so awesome that he can take evil done against us and use it for good that he does in us and does through us. In Genesis 50, 20, Joseph said to his brothers who had sold him into slavery, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Think about this. God used the greatest evil ever committed in this world for the greatest good. The greatest evil ever committed was the crucifixion of Jesus. The greatest good that ever came, uh, that's ever come to this world, came as a result of that evil. Jesus died for our sins, paid the price for them so we could, be, could know the God we were made to know. In a cursed world, the worst of things can happen to the best of people. In a cursed world, a perfect person, Jesus, can get crucified rather than worshiped. In a cursed world, the greatest human ever born, according to Jesus, can get beheaded for telling the truth. In a cursed world, bad things can happen to us, no matter how good we are. The more you know, the more you'll know you don't know. The more you understand, the more you'll understand there's a lot more you don't understand. The more you know God, the more you'll know you don't know him. So what do we do? What do we know? What do we understand? What we, these are some things we should know when time and chance overtake us. Number one, we should know that life in a cursed world is unfair and unlike God intended. Life in a cursed world is unfair and it's unlike God intended it to be. The shock is not that sometimes life is so bad. The shock should be that life sometimes is so good. The whole world's cursed. The whole race is cursed. The God of this world's the devil who's seeking someone to devour. And you had a good day? Wow. Pretty amazing. Number two, we should know that suffering is a result of man's sin and is not a reflection upon the love, goodness, or ability of God. Suffering is a result of man's sin 
and is not a reflection upon the love, goodness, or ability of God. None of this would have happened had Adam and Eve not sinned. Number three, we should know that God is the chief sufferer in the universe. God's chief sufferer in the universe. How many of you are parents? How many of you have had your children hurting and you would have done anything to swap positions? To take their pain to release it, to relieve it for them. You would have taken it all day. I'm guessing you'd take a bullet in a heartbeat to protect your child. Wouldn't, wouldn't take half a second to figure that out. Do you think you love more than God loves? And when you hurt, there's a God in heaven who loves you more than anybody else ever has, more than anybody else ever will, and you cannot suffer and him not suffer more. Every parent gets this. If you don't have kids, you may not, but I guarantee you, every parent gets this. God suffers most as he looks down upon a world that is nothing like it, he created to be. He hurts most because he loves best. So who grieves the most over a prodigal? Jesus. Who grieves the most over a doctor's diagnosis that we feared most? Jesus. Who grieves the most at any funeral? Jesus. It wasn't supposed to be this way. Who grieves the most when you and those you love hurt? Jesus. He's the chief sufferer in the universe. Number four, we should know that God is with us whether we feel him or not. We should know that God's with us whether we feel him or not. God's not with you because you feel him. He's with you because he always is and he promised he would be. If you're a Christian, he lives in you. How could he not be with you? Number five, we should know that God never allows more on us than he puts in us if we trust him. Never allows more on us than he puts in us if we trust him. We know that making it may feel exactly like we're not making it at all. We know that victory sometimes is just refusing to let go of God. Some of you are hurting right now. You're wondering, am I going to make it? I'm telling you, you're here. You're making it. You say, but I still hurt so bad. I know you do, but you're making it. You're still here. You're still seeking to love God. Still trying to be who he wants you to be. You haven't quit on him. You're making it. I wish it was easier than it is. It's not. I wish somehow we could avoid all the pain. We can't. But you need to know you're making it. Number six, we know that God will use the bad for some good if we trust him. He'll use the bad for some good if we trust him. Joseph saved a nation because of the bad that happened to him. Jesus saved a people because of the crucifixion that happened to him. So God will use the bad for good in your life. Number seven, we know that we will uh, come to know God in a deeper and better way if we trust him. We'll know him in a deeper and better way if we trust him. Now let me close with a real personal story that illustrates what I've been talking about. Betsy and I have two healthy daughters, we have two healthy grand, uh, son-in-laws, and we have four healthy grandchildren. We're deeply grateful for this. But recognize and understand that there are notorious sinners who have healthy children and healthy grandchildren. Right? It's not just Christians. Betsy's youngest brother and his wife love the Lord like we do. They've been working in Bible school all week. They're deeply involved in God's work at their church. Their first child, Nolan, was born with severe heart defects, spent his brief life here six months in ICU at Vanderbilt Hospital, and then died. Had Nolan been healthy, he'd be 30 today. If Jeff and Melanie, Jeff and Melanie conceived again, gave birth to a special needs daughter named Bailey. Bailey's been here, some of you have seen her. Bailey's now 27, doesn't speak, probably has the mind of about a two-year-old. Did God pick us for healthy families and pick them for theirs? If so, how do you really love and trust God like that? Or did time and chance overtake us all? In a book cursed, not unfair, not as God intended for it to be world. Did God orchestrate their pain 
or does he grieve the most over it? I think the latter. So what do you do with that? What are you going to say to the couple whose child is born with enormous problems? What are you going to do if your child or your grandchild is born with enormous problems? Will you blame God or will you trust him? Do you have a faith that works when your world gets shattered? When your prayers go unanswered? Years ago, my sister was dying by the inch of neuropathy. And someone asked me, they said, well, do you have enough faith for God to heal her? And it didn't take me half a second. I said, I have enough faith for God not to. He didn't, and here I am, walking with Jesus, loving him more. I have, I have enough faith for God not to give me what I want. Do you? I have enough faith for it all not to work out like I wished it would. Do you? If you don't, you have, don't really have much biblical faith. How many of you have ever been to the funeral of a baby? I've buried two besides Nolan. A couple of Mississippi conceived twins. One of them dominated the nutrition and starved the other out. Found out that's a pretty common thing. The other funeral was here. The couple was encouraged by others to abort Caleb because he had severe defects. They said he'll just live a few hours and die. They didn't believe in abortion. They brought him to term. He lived a few hours and died. Both of them I buried them basically in shoeboxes. That's how small the caskets were. Did God love these couples? Yes. More than anyone else ever has, more than anyone else ever will. Did God love these two babies who I believe went straight to heaven? Yes. More than anyone else ever would have, more than anyone else ever could have. Whose heart broke the most over these unfair losses? Was it the moms? Was it the dads? Was it the grandparents? No. He who loves best hurts most. It was God. It wasn't supposed to be this way. Time and chance overtake us all in a cursed, not as God intended for it to be, world. Sometimes it brings us health and happiness. Sometimes it brings us sickness and tragedy. Jesus didn't avoid it. The heroes of the Bible weren't exempt from it. Neither am I, neither are you. You don't just need Jesus because you might die. You need Jesus because you might not. You might not. The Bible's a real book written by a real God for real people in a real world. It's not a book, it's not a book of fantasies for people who live in denial. You're living in a cursed world. Sooner or later, you're going to need a real God or you're going to be in some real trouble. Biblical faith, real Christianity, is trusting God when you don't understand. It's knowing he's with you when you feel like he isn't. It's knowing he loves you when you feel like he doesn't. It's doubting your doubts. It's believing your beliefs. It's holding on when you feel like letting go. It's being okay when life isn't because you know the end of the story. It's knowing that no matter how hard this life is, God is still good, he still loves you, and one day the pain will be over and you'll never suffer again. Amen. All my trials, Lord, soon be over.